We are on session three tonight of Preventing the Dismantling of America. And we have already dealt with uh, what the Illuminati have planned for America, some of the tactics they have used. We have also dealt with their philosophy and how they have interwoven a lot of it into the church. If you ever really take the time to understand what the symbolism is and some of the basic things of paganism, you can see how that it actually permeates almost every aspect of our society. Uh, when you look at originally in, in the, the uh, settling of America with the Puritans, they had expunged all of that out of what they wanted. When they first came to America, they said that the laws of Moses were going to be the laws of the land. And then once masonry came in, it began to bring all those things in with it. And it has so contaminated everything about us. I want us to start tonight in Revelation chapter 3. And I'm going to read uh, about the Laodicean church. Almost every major uh, teacher who, uh, within evangelicalism that teaches eschatology, uh, they, the majority of them agree that uh, the Laodicean church really speaks of the age uh, that we're in today, and they know that it's going to be the church or the state of the church uh, before Jesus Christ comes back. And so one of the things we need to do, we need to contrast that to how the Apostle Paul said that when Jesus comes back, he's coming for a church without any spot and a wrinkle. And I'm hoping that the job of biblical life and those that hear this is to bring about the church that goes from the Laodicean church to that church without spot and a wrinkle. Let's pick up in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amin, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold, I would thou wert hot or cold, but so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing, knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Anoint thine eyes with eyes have that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, some of the things that we need to realize, probably over, since World War II, a lot has transpired within Western civilization. Uh, today, if you go to Europe, Christianity is on the fast track to the downslide. Many of the great uh, cathedrals of old with the old line churches have now either been shut down or they have been purchased uh, by Islamic fraction, factions that have converted them into mosques. That uh, most of Europe claims to either be Muslim or atheist. Of course, there are some noble Christians over there trying to make a difference. Uh, we see the same thing of, of the decline in the church uh, in, in Canada and the United States. It seems like the only way really to get a great church to grow or a church to really grow big is to compromise and to become worldly. And how many know that's the Laodicean church in a nutshell? That because it uses materialism of, as proof that it's walking with God, materialism can mimic spirituality. And so we're seeing that the church in America and in the Western, in Western areas, we, we see that materialism, paganism, and progressive philosophies have reduced the modern church to what we see here in the book of Revelation. We think we're something. We think that we can do something. We build great buildings. We, we, we send satellites into orbit so that we can have Christian programming to produce more Laodiceans. And we really think that we're moving and really doing something for the kingdom of God. But Jesus says, you say that you're rich and you increase with goods and have need of nothing, but actually you need everything, everything that really counts. Now, as, as I read this, I, I saw 
the church as it is today, but there's several things that really jumped out uh, in my consciousness or in my spirit and said that I counsel thee to, be, to buy of me gold tried in the fire. That's where we're headed. That's what the Illuminati want. They, they, wanna, they want to persecute the church. They want to add the fire of what, they, what they're doing to destroy the church. But in, in kind of meditating on this, I think that we have two choices. There are two kinds of fire from God in the word of God. There's the fire of God that causes you to be zealous toward God, that you burn out all the things. It's like going through a refiner's fire. You burn out all the things that are not of God so that you can have that pure gold because of, of your desire really to examine your own life, examine what you believe, examine the things that you do, and begin demanding of yourself to return to the Word of God. We have, that's plan A. Plan B is God's fire of affliction. And so really God's fire of affliction and the fire of the Illuminati persecution are the same thing. I don't want that. I don't want that. And really what concerns me is in the Laodicean church, you're neither hot nor cold. You're so satisfied that people don't want to really grow. They don't really want to get into the Word. They, they like to have these little sermonettes and these sound bites to make them feel like there's something, that there's no depth to it, there's no real understanding to it, and they're so satisfied with that that it's hard to budge them either way. Haven't you guys met believers like that? It's, just, it's, it's hard. They, they, they get this frustrated look on their face if you really start explaining the Word of God and it begins knocking them out of their, their little padded comfort zone and instead of dealing with it, say, well, you know what? Maybe I need to study these things. They get mad at you and they want to shut you up. That is symptomatic of the Laodicean church. And so if they don't move toward the things of God and if God really loves them and wants to save them, the only choice he has if they won't embrace the fire of the Holy Spirit is they have to be embraced by the fire of affliction. I know many times Mary and I have discussed just what is it going to take for people to wake up? What is, and I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church. What is it going to take for them to begin saying, I need to return to the Word of God. What's being given to me in the pulpit isn't working anymore. It's not of real value. It has the form of godliness, but it denies the power thereof. What's it going to take? I pray it's not the fire of affliction. And some of the things tonight that, I, uh, that I'm going to get into, I think that we can do to help maybe dislodge them out of being lukewarm. If they get cold, at least they know they need something. If they get hot, it burns out the world. Because if you, if you refuse to bow to Babylon, you're like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They can throw you in the fiery furnace, and the only thing that burns was the things of Babylon that had you bound, and you walk out the other side. I would rather be a free man in God that can truly see and truly live righteously and walking the ways of God that it can bring glory to God and that I, like when Jesus told the devil, you have nothing in me, we need to get to that same place. The Apostle John in 1 John 5 says that if a man keeps himself, the wicked one touches him not. That's where we need to be. There's nothing of Babylon for him to touch. The second thing that jumped out, Jesus said, be zealous to repent. Be zealous to repent. So the way to, av to avoid the fire is through repentance. But we have a lot of believers that refuse to repent. They, they have been put into a spell. Like the Apostle Paul in, in, in uh, Galatia, I could ask the church, who has bewitched you that you believe another gospel? A gospel that doesn't require anything of you but requires everything of God. 
that once you're saved, you don't have to walk in holiness. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 21. This is the story of a young boy who was demon-possessed. And all the disciples of Jesus who had been casting out demons, who had been given that authority to do that by Jesus and had enjoyed great success, when they got to this young boy, none of them could do it. Now we pick up with this in verse 14. And when they came, uh, when they came to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him. So this is, this is after the fact that all the disciples tried to cast out this demon. They could not do it. And finally Jesus shows up. I mean, oh, right now we need Jesus to show up, and he needs to have a refiner's fire and a fuller soap in the body of Christ. And when they came down to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic, and sore vexed, for oftentimes he falleth into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? And how, shall, how long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples apart to Jesus and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you that if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed and shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, most people stop right there. Well, it was faith. They didn't have enough faith. And so we go about trying to develop faith all the time. And how many know developing faith in God is good? Deve and developing to be faithful to God is good. But you need to add the next thing to it. You have to add something to faith because this was a particular demon that had been so entrenched that faith alone couldn't get it out. He says, how be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Let me tell you something. The rut that the body of Christ is in right now is not going to leave without prayer and fasting. Not on their part, but on the part of the trained, on the part of the remnant, those that have woken up. They, they're, they're awake now. They have come out of slumber because they know the time of the redemption draweth nigh and the hour is dark. And those that can hear God and begin walking with God, it's time to pray and it's time to fast to break this off the rest of the body of Christ. If you're lukewarm, you're not going to do it for yourself. We know what's going on. We know how the church, the, the, the Illuminati have used paganism to put the church asleep. They used the doctrine of Balaam to get Israel off. They're using the same doctrine today with the body of Christ and have done so for over 100 years. So that our slumber has become tradition. And one of the things I have found, men will argue doctrine, but they'll kill you over their traditions. And so the only way to get rid of that tradition demon is through prayer and fasting. And I think uh, th this is so important. I can remember years ago I heard this story. And if, if I'm remembering it right, I believe it was David Wilkerson that he was sitting on a plane. And there was a well-dressed man there. And it was actually back when they served you food on planes. You know, there, there, once, once upon a time in a land far away, there were airlines that did not charge you extra for your baggage, and they actually fed you on the planes. And back, I want to say, late 80s, early 90s, and, and he said there was this well-dressed gentleman as they brought the food. The man said, no, thank you. I'm fasting today. And so the minister thought, well, this must be another believer. I mean, he was very well-dressed, very gracious the way he said it. And so he struck up a conversation. And he said, well, why are you fasting? He says, well, I'm a warlock. And, and witches and warlocks worldwide have fast 
every Thursday for the destruction of the family unit. You see, in paganism, they hate the traditional family unit of one husband and one wife because God is the one who instituted it in the Garden of Eden. It was God that established that precedent. They want to destroy that, and so they, they don't care if it's one guy, six women, six women, one guy, two women, two guys, or any other combination, as long as it destroys the way that God had established it. Now, they have been fasting since at least 1965 with the formation of the Church of Satan. It may even go back further than that. that they, and how many know that when you look at what they're, they're, the fasting that they did for those years has moved society along to where everyone is now questioning and redefining the family unit. So that if you point back to God's definition, now in America, you're called a hate monger. So how many think that they're fasting and that with the, the spells and incantations that they have done have been effective? While we've been asleep, just worried about getting in more money, we turn everything into an offering in ministry so that we can impress with big buildings and all these great things. And the whole time, they're going after the very heart because in a church, guys, the family unit is the strength of the church. The family unit is the strength of a nation. No nation has survived when you take apart that family unit. Since the beginning of man, every civilization, when you destroy the family unit, that civilization is soon destroyed thereafter. No exceptions. I mean, they're going for the juggler vein, and we're not, we're not fasting. We're not, we're not seeking the face of God. We're not doing what we need to do to counter what they're doing. Well, they're fasting. We're feasting on all the delicacies that you can get in Laodicea. So, it's t so the only way that this thing is going to be cast out is that we're going to have to begin praying and fasting the biblical way. And the, the chapter in the Bible that defines fasting better than anywhere else in the Word of God, and it's so apropos for what we're wanting, is Isaiah 58. Now I'm going to kind of take this apart just a little bit because when I read verses 1 and 2, it kind of sounds like the church today, that it's all, I, I walk with God, really? What flesh have you crucified lately? What commandments are you walking in? What ways are you walking in? What have you changed in your life to line up with the Word of God? And even with the Hebraic Roots Movement, guys, I, I, oh, tell me more about this. Hmm, that's interesting. How intriguing. They don't do any of it. But they want to be told all of it. James says, don't be a hearer of the Word only, but be a doer. And what, what we know, God requires us to walk in. You know, I'm, I'm kind of dealing with that with, with, my, with uh, some areas I know in nutrition. That there's a lot that I know that I've not been walking in and all that's changing. There's a lot that I know spiritually and I'm beginning to demand of myself to walk in it. Because whether, whether it's taking care of your body or taking care of your spirit or using financial restraint when you deal with things, everything of this world, you can know it, but are you doing it and it tries to put you asleep because they, you get lulled into this safety? I know it. But I, I like the Jewish way of looking at things. That we, you know, the old axiom in, in America is those who can't do, go teach. You know, you couldn't really do economics, so you go teach it in a university. The ones that really understand economics are millionaires. But Hebraically, the only time that you can teach is when you can do. Because if you can't do, you don't know. You might know statistics, you might know facts, but you really don't know 
how to get it done. Let's pick up here in verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. Let, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinances of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. The, they have the form of godliness. Now, Brother Mike, what does it look like when you're walking in the ways of God? Well, you, you wear a suit. You have a nice Bible. You don't cuss. And you go to church, put a smile on your face while you're there, put an offering in the offering plate, and when you leave, you don't give another thought of it until you go back the next Sunday. That's exactly what's happening here. They want to know so they can impress fam, friends and family with all these things that they know, but they never do any of it. And I like, instead of him saying, talk to the house of Israel, talk to the house of Jacob. Jacob the conniver, the surplanter, go talk to the one that's just running after a blessing. Wrestled with an angel all night. And then the angel says, what do you want? Just let me go. I want a blessing. And you look back and th this whole moving city that was just on the over other side over there that he had left while he was wrestling with the angel. Jacob, who does that belong to? Oh, that's mine. But I just want another blessing. It's time for us to learn to live beyond blessings. You see, when you start walking with God, you become the blessing. You don't have to run after blessings. That's what I'm after. We get so excited when God says, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But we forget about the part. Make you a blessing. By the way that you live and the things that you do in righteousness opens up doorways to heaven to do things in the earth that heaven could not do unless God has a people that are obedient to him. And this, this is a call to be obedient once again. We do not need window-dressed Christians. We, we do not need the facade Christians. We need Christians that are not veneer, but have, that are live for God from, from the tips of their toes all the way up to the top of their head. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the Word of God. And if God's Word says do it, they do it. If God's Word says don't do it, they don't do it. They don't argue with the book. They live the book is what we need. And so we've got to move beyond this. And so some of the things that was happening in Isaiah's day was hap is happening in our day today. And God said the prescription is true biblical fasting. Let's go on. Now they, well, let me read this and I'll make some comments because this is real interesting. Wherefore have ye fasted, say, say they, and thou hast not seen. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and, and thou takest no knowledge. Behold, in the days of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A, ma a day for a man to afflict his soul, to bow down his head in, uh, as a bulrush, and to, and to, and to uh, spread sackcloth and ash under him. Wilt thou call this a fast? A day acceptable unto the Lord. Now, fasting is supposed to afflict your flesh. It's supposed to show your flesh its place. That your flesh serves you, you don't serve your flesh. And yet, in Isaiah, just like in the Laodicean church, they found a way of making fasting fleshly. One-upmanship. 
They did it for strife. They were fighting. They were debating with one another. They used fasting as a way of hitting somebody with a fist of wickedness. You know, if people would use as much energy in doing the word as they do trying to explain their way around not having to do the word, the church would be in great shape today. We need to start explaining our way around sin that we don't have to do sin anymore and start finding the way into righteousness. Now, let's go on. This, this is where it gets into the good stuff. Is not this the fast that I have chosen to lose the bands of wickedness? And so what, what, what he's beginning to give us is he said, you were fasting for all these fleshly reasons. How about fasting for some spiritual reasons? It, guys, if you don't eat and you don't pray, you're just going hungry. You're not fasting. Fasting is putting the body in its place, saying, I'm not going to live by the appetites of my flesh today. But I'm going to feed my spirit the word of God, and I'm going to seek the face of God. But God says, I want you to go one beyond that. I want you to target some things. This is where the faith comes in. Jesus was rebuking them for not having enough faith. I think they had scattered faith. You know, there, there comes a time for a shotgun approach to things, but then there comes a time for a laser approach to things. And God, through the prophet Isaiah, is giving us a focus that as I'm fasting, I've got to begin praying against some things to make a difference in the people of God. The first one. To loose the bands of wickedness. Now that is not wickedness in the church. That is bands of control that wickedness has placed on the people of God. How more apropos is that than what the Illuminati has done to the church in Western society that we're all bound up thinking we're free, we're actually setting cold in a dungeon of paganism, and we have been handed a warm fuzzy, and we have been made to believe that everything's great. But if we will begin fasting and say, Father, today what I'm fasting for, I pray for the church in Western society. I pray for the church in America. I pray for the church in Canada. I pray for the church in Europe. You can say, well, Brother Mike, how come you're not praying for the church in Africa, praying for the church in China, praying for the church in Asia? Have, they've already went through their times of affliction. They're awake. Do you know that? They're awake. Most of the things that we spend all our time arguing about is trivial to people outside of Western society. They live the word because if they don't, they die. In fact, I heard years ago when uh, Dr. Larry Lee was coming under some fire and all of a sudden, uh, you know how the media will turn on somebody and, and a lot of the Christians that don't think will turn on somebody when you don't even know the whole story. And he began, really quit ministering in America, but it opened, it opened up the world to him because until the American church began persecuting him, he was not validated in the eyes of the church in China, the church in Asia, the church in Africa, and other places in the world where Christians really have to believe what the Bible says. We don't have the luxury of deciding, well, I think I like this, and maybe just a little sprinkle of this, but I don't really like this because it requires too much of me. They don't have that option. Our affluence mingled in with paganism has so bound us up that we're prisoners and we don't know it. He goes on to say, and to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. 
That's to be the prayer focus when we fast God's way. It's not about who is seeing me fast. It's not about the notoriety I get when I fast or to win an argument or anything else. It is I go directly for the devil's juggler vein over God's people. I go after the bands of wickedness. I go after the heavy burdens. I go after those that are oppressed for the yokes to be broken. When I do that, I begin making a difference in the house of God. You know, if... May I am going to say this. Do you notice up here in verses 3 through 5, it talks about all the strife and everything? Has anybody had a lot of, ever seen a lot of drama in churches? Sometimes it can be over an old altar that's about to fall over, so they replace it. And I tell you what, it was, it was like D-Day. Little things because it breeds in strife. Guys, that's the devil's work. It's not for the body of Christ. But look, our prayer focus, loose the bands of wickedness and undo the heavy burden to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Now, Isaiah gets really radical with the next one. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry that thou mayest bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou coverest him and that thou hidest not uh, thyself from thine own flesh. Here's a thought. How much a day in food do you eat? Depends. Around my house, it depends if it's the Sabbath or not. Because on the Sabbath, we feast. But God's word says, take the money that you are going to spend on food and help somebody in need with it. Show love with it. Show kindness with it. Now, preachers, this is not take up an offering to give to the church for the food that you were trying to fast with. This one, the church doesn't get. In fact, most preachers have never done the research that there are, there are different kinds of tithes in the Old Testament, and once every three years, uh, and, uh, I think it's once every three or four years, you actually are tithing 30%. But one 10% slice goes directly to the poor. Boy, you don't hear that preached too much in churches, do you? This is not about taking up an offering, guys. This is about as you're fasting and as you're praying and you're praying for people to have their bonds loosed and God to begin doing something in their life, if you're in the right frame of mind, the Holy Spirit will lead you to somebody in need and you can reach into their pocket and hand them a $20 bill or $40 or whatever it is, depending upon how long you're going to fast, and say, Jesus sent me to you today to tell you that he loves you, he has a plan for your life, and he wanted me to give you this. And what I have found is sometimes the, the person who is the most ratter tattered isn't the person sometimes in the greatest need. You can't be led by your eyes or by your hearing. You've got to be led by the Holy Spirit. And what a difference that would make. Can you imagine you're sitting there struggling I re well, I remember years ago when I was in Germany and being in the military, the military paid for the chapel and everything else, and, and so all the offerings were basically, you know, we could buy Bibles and supplies and different things. And so we began to find out some of the uh, newer enlisted, like the privates and the, the corporals, and, you know, you're not quite in getting as much pay as sergeants and higher up, and you may have two or three kids, and, and you're living in, in uh, military housing. And a lot of times they found themselves having a whole lot more month than they had money. And we began to find that there were people that weren't able to feed their kids, like especially the last week of the month, the last week before payday. And so we got together with some of the elders in the church and we formed the God Squad. And we let the MPs know what we were doing because you can't get arrested if you're, you know, one o'clock in the morning and you're kind of going around the housing area and you don't live there. That's a good way to end up in, a, in the stockade. So we let them know what we were doing. 
And in the stairwells, even though the mail didn't come there, the every, every door going into the house had a mail slot. And so when we find out that somebody was really struggling and, and really needed, needed help, we would take some money, we'd get it from the chaplain, we'd put the cash in an envelope, a little note about how much God loves them, and we'd just sneak up and just pop it through the door. So they'd wake up in the morning, and you don't know how many times in church we heard stories of, I didn't even have anything to feed my kids for breakfast. And we had four days left, and, and we just simply said, God's going to do something. And we get up the next morning, and there in the foyer is $50. And so before I had to go on off to work in the military, I ran down to the commissary or the PX that was open a little earlier, and I got my kids some breakfast. And I told my wife, go ahead and take the rest of it and, and go to the commissary and get some food for the rest of the week. And you, would, you wouldn't believe the glow of joy, real joy, real joy. And that, there, that we were just praying about that. We gathered our kids in the living room and said, Jesus, we need your help. And he said, what a faith builder when that morning God supplied. I mean, the guys of us that were doing that, we just kind of walked around this high almost. You know, there wasn't a drug that could compare to the, this being used of God. That's what this is talking about here. Whether they even know God or not, maybe, maybe you're going to be the first real representative of Jesus that they have ever met. You say, man, God loves you. And, and he wants you to have this to to take care of maybe a need in your life. Now normally, the way a lot of us are, where your budget stretched pretty tight, you don't have any extra to do that with. But it just so happens you've been fasting for the last three days and that put an extra $20 in your pocket. And you're afflicting your flesh just blessed somebody else. That's what this is talking about. When fasting is no longer about you, you're fasting. Do I need to say that again? When fasting is no longer about you, you're fasting. But if you're fasting for you, you're still fasting in the flesh. It's about others. Let's pick up in verse 8. What we need to kind of underline in your Bible is then and if in the next few verses. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall, spread, shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord is thy rear guard. Now, when you do fasting correctly, it brings revelation. You become more sensitive to the Spirit of God. I know men like Tom Deckard that uh, they have went on extended fasts, and uh, I have never done one for 21 days. But they say that when you have fasted that long, you become, the spirit realm becomes more real than this physical realm. And one of the things that, and I've heard this from several different men, that uh, they have to quit driving because you're seeing angels more than you're seeing the road. <laughs> that when you, need, when you need understanding, some of the greatest revelation I've ever had has been times during the fasting because after a day or two, it clears the fog. You know what I'm talking about? The fog of when you're trying to hear the voice of God or just trying to put two and two together and trying to figure out where God wants you and all these different things. If you start fasting and praying for other people, God says, if you put others first, you have been put into a position to where I can bless you. It brings revelation. Our health is renewed. It says that, that, that um, your health shall spring forth speedily. Now, this is something that unless you've studied naturopathy or nutrition, you don't know. When you eat normal meals... And how many know in America we don't really eat normal meals? A normal meal is about 400 calories. You can go back into the 50s and the dinner plate was like this. Now we're eating off of what they used to put the turkey on. And we call that a dinner plate. That 
when you're eating normal meals that 35% of the energy your body has is burnt up in digesting that food. If you overeat, it can be as high as 60% of all the energy that you have is in digesting food. And so then you also have to work out the energy that you're expending, your mental energy, which leaves very little energy left in your body for it to heal itself. Guys, there have, there have been people that have had stage three and four cancer that have went on cleansing fasts, that there's some things you can get to help your body with it, but because your body's not digesting solid food, it can take all the energy from the things that you're giving to purify it to begin cleansing and healing its own body. You see, there, this, this is not just spiritual. God has placed within the body mechanisms that when you fast and you fast properly, that it makes you healthier. There's something to think on. There are spiritual benefits, there are mental benefits, and there are physical benefits from fasting. And if we do it right, we can see others set free while we get restored in the process. That our light will come, that we have revelation knowledge, that, that health problems. Guys, stage three and four cancer. We'll fast for 21 days, and some of them will go 30, 32 days with a cleansing fast. And when they get done, they go back to the doctor, and they run every test in the book. Not only is the cancer gone, but they can't find cancer anywhere in their body. Did you know that's abnormal? Did you know that you have cancer cells in your body right now, and you produce cancer cells every day, and your immune system destroys them? And when cancer has a chance to grow is when your, your immune system is so overtaxed, it can't kill them all, and they begin ganging up on your immune system. So everybody always has some somewhere, but yet when people do this for this extended period of time like this and do it right, they can't find any anywhere in the Bible, or anywhere in the Bible, anywhere in their body. Yeah, live the word, Bible, Bible, Okay. Which kind of makes us wonder what reading and how much of that is causing it when we leave God's ways of doing things to include the way food's supposed to be raised. Then God also says, listen, I'm, I'm not only going to bring revelation, I'm not only going to cause your health to be renewed, I'm going to empower your walk in the ways of God. When you fast, doing the right thing gets a whole lot easier. Thy righteousness shall go before thee. You know what that's talking about? Righteousness is doing what God said to do. These are acts of righteousness. And your reputation begins to build that people say, listen, this guy keeps his word. This guy really walks with God. When this guy prays, there's a marine angel in heaven who goes, hoo I want someone, when they pray, I want to have some power behind it when they pray for me. I want to have the power in me when I pray. That happens when we add fasting. We begin doing things God's way. And I like the final one. God will be your rear guard. Now, in the King James, it says rear reward. That is an old English word for rear guard. If you look in Ephesians chapter 6 with all the armor, all of it is to face forward. There's nothing protecting the back. You, you, the, the sword, the shield are made to go this way. God says, listen, when you fast and you put others first in your fasting and prayer life, I got your back. I like that. The devil can't sneak up on me because if he tries to sneak up on me, he's going to come face to face with El Shaddai that flicked his finger and threw him out of heaven. So if the devil is going to fight me, God says, I'm going to make sure it's a fair fight, and he fights you head on where your weapons are made to work when we fast. But the benefits continue. Now we get into the ifs. Verse 9, and then thou shalt call, and the Lord will answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, here I am. Oh, how many times have, have I had this in my own life, and how many times have I talked to believers? I pray, and it hits the floor. When was the last time you fasted for somebody else? 
When was the sometime, when was the last time that you interceded for somebody else? We need to get to the place, guys, with what's coming on the earth, what, what is planned on the earth, that when we cry out, God says, here am I. You never get that response from heaven that hell doesn't say, oh, woe is me. God says, here am I. The devil says, woe is me. I like that equation. But we've got to do it God's way. Then thou shalt call and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry and he shall say, here am I. If. God's getting ready to add some more things to fasting. If. Thou shalt take away from the midst of the, the yoke the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. Do you know how many phone calls that I, have, that I take of Christians complaining about their leadership? They won't do this. They... I, I, there, there are some Christians, you could hand them a gold brick and they'd find some reason to complain about it. They don't like this. They don't like that. They don't like, well, church was too cold last week. Last time it was too hot and the preacher preached too long. Well, he didn't give us any meat. That's what this is talking about. God says, since you're in the process of killing your fleshliness, quit griping and shaking the finger at people. Start dealing with here. If people would start praying and fasting for their pastors, if they would simply take the time that they were griping about them and convert it to fasting and prayer, number one, we'd have a whole lot of skinny Christians. And number two, we would have a whole lot of men that were burning with the power of God in their lives. Because what you don't realize, the whole time that you're griping and you're shaking your finger, you're loosing satanic energies toward that minister. The devil is using the power of your griping to loose demons to attack that man. And then we wonder why God doesn't want to back up our words. The enemy's too busy doing it. New Testament, the servant of the Lord must not strive. That's one of the tests we dealt with here not too long ago in the, in the Covenant Faith series. Abraham passed the test of strife. He would not strive with a lot but created peace. And because of that, God blessed him and took him on to another level. Most Christians are never taken on to the other level because they're too busy walking in strife with all the Christians around them. And it all comes down to this. The pastor or other Christians are not pleasing their flesh. Not their spirit. Because if you were upset about not getting fed spiritually, you would want the pastor to preach longer. Preach deeper. Preach harder. Usually it's some little something about your flesh. Well, they didn't sing the songs that I like. Well, maybe God wanted to have the song sung that he likes for a change. Come on now. This And, and speaking vanity, that can be coarse jesting. It can be a lot of things. I remember years ago, I heard... Uh, Rod Parsley talking about Lester Summerall. And they were at a meeting, and it was kind of like how you relax at, at home, type between meetings. And they all kicked back, and they were just shooting the breeze. And the longer that they shot the breeze, the more frustrated Lester got. He said, well, if you guys aren't going to talk the word, I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> he, just, he didn't want any of this vanity and all this stuff that just doesn't do anything. Words of life should come out of our mouth. So we, we, got, we got to put a check here. That's part of what the fasting is, put a check here. Some believers can fast food and survive. But if you ask them to fast complaining for 30 days, their heads would explode. But yet, God put it here along with fasting. Then God says, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shalt thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. 
I mean, that, that's some powerful stuff right there. You may, you may feel in obscurity as far as heaven is concerned. You start doing this, the revelation of God will start flowing through you and you'll begin bringing light. That's, it, it, isn't it talking about being salt in the earth again? Isn't that what Jesus was talking about? That we are the salt of the earth, but if it's lost its savor, this is how to get its savor back. That the light would come and if there's any darkness in you, it's going to be as the noonday. How many know at high noon it's kind of hard to find darkness? I want that in my life. No paganism, no darkness. And the Lord shall guide thee continually. How often? How often? Sometimes, once a month, in the spare of the moment, I like continually. I want to be led by the Holy Spirit all the time. I want to have an ongoing conversation with heaven that when I pray, he says, here am I, and then I can begin drawing from the wisdom of God. Not just to give him my whole bunch of wants. How many know that there is some revelation knowledge you need to walk in that has nothing to do with your wants? It has about who to be. Who you are is far greater than your wants. Who you really are on the inside is much greater than anything that you can put in your house or that you can drive. Who you are is eternal and nobody can take it away from you. All these external things can be taken away, but who you are on the inside. See, that's what the devil has been trying to do. He's been trying to wither up who we are on the inside by poisoning us with these bands of wickedness, with all this oppression going on. He's destroying us on the inside, but on the outside, we still got all the stuff. But there's no substance. Jesus said, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Yet on the inside, we're supposed to have rivers of living water flowing out of us, but to be truthful, most of the body is like a dry, parched desert because we've made everything external. The Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose water fails not. No matter what goes through in life, no matter what the enemy tries to do, if you do this right, you're going to have on the inside of you what you need, which is far greater than anything that you could have on the outside of you. Verse 12 is so important. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt rise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairs of the breach, the restore of paths to dwell in. When we do this right, we're going to return back to the Word of God. We're not going to be neither hot nor cold. We're going to be hot that we're going to be founded not on pagan things that have been sown into everything that we do, but we've returned back to the purity of the Word of God. We have returned back to walking in the kingdom, that those that are of us, that we're going to not only affect ourselves, but we are going to be an inspiration to those around us, that they're the ones that's going to be called. You see, I like that. I've seen too many movements where the preacher, everything was centered up around the preacher, but when he dies, the work stops. But if he raises up sons and daughters in the faith that continue the work, he can step back and get promoted, if you will, but the work continues and expands. It's because those of you will be called this. They will build the old waste places. Can you see the picture here? That over here is the ways of God that God established. These are, the, these are my feasts. These are my statutes, my judgments, my commandments. And we have abandoned them. And we're so busy here in the world that that ends up looking like an abandoned lot. Did you ever see a house that's been abandoned? And everything grows up and the trees get crazy and all these different things. That's what that's talking about here. But this was, but what was abandoned was the ways of God for something else. And then all of a sudden, 
They can, you know, in, in the flesh, the, or the natural, they call it urban renewal. They'll go in and they'll fix up the house. They'll get all the trash out and they'll knock down all the weeds and reclaim the land from the jungle that tends to take over. Why is it so prominent in the earth that that happens? Because it teaches us that if you step away from the things of God for something else, the weeds, the thorns, and the thistles will immediately take it over and turn it into a waste place. The church has done that. We have used grace as a reason to abandon the ways of God and play out here in Babylon. And God is saying, you know what? You do this thing right, begin fasting that those bands of wickedness be broken and that the revelation and the anointing that comes out of you for praying and fasting for the body and to helping those in need will begin returning not only to establish you, but then those of you that are inspired by you will go back and begin to walk in holiness again, begin walking in the ways of God again. I'm really getting tired, guys, of trying to get Christians to see the word. I am tired of them arguing with me about things they believe that absolutely have no basis in the word and they discount the word but they place their feelings or their situations. There, there, there's a tendency, I, I call it situ, situational theology, that you went through a situation so you changed your theology. that people begin rewriting theology because it didn't match their experience when maybe their experience in their heart wasn't in line with the word that produced the experience. We need to stop that. It's time to question everything and ask the right, right questions. Is this in the word? Is it Old Testament and New Testament? And let me tell you something. Every major, all major doctrines in the New Testament have their origin in the Old. If you can't find it in the Old, then you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. Because that roof of the New Testament has got to be founded on the foundation of the Torah, the walls of the prophets and the writings, and the New Testament is the roof. And that roof cannot sit on the ground by itself. That's a weird-looking thing, isn't it? but it needs to be set up on the structure. And if you can't trace it all the way back to the foundation, then uh, you're in a bad situation. I want to see the waste places of God restored and the paths to walk in restored. And that's only going to happen when the trained and the elect, the remnant, begin fasting and praying I'm not going to argue with Christians anymore. I'm going to fast and pray until they're set free, then they're going to want truth. I cannot convince somebody lukewarm that they either need to be cold or hot. They're falling to sleep in the devil's jacuzzi and about to drown. But I can pray and see them get out of that thing and find out where they really are in God. That's our task. How long is this going to be? forever until you go on to be in glory. As long as you're in this flesh, you need to fast and pray. Come on. One week you may fast one day. One week, the next week you may fast three days. God may put, put it on your heart to do an extended fast. You got to be led by the Holy Spirit. Then there are fasts that the pastor may call. A Daniel kind of fast where you just fast certain foods for an extended period of time. Leaders can call that. But that leader may not be facing the demon that you've got to cast out. You've got to be fasted up and prayed up before you come against that. Faith without fasting and praying is not going to get it done. But we have got to start being led by the book and we've got to start being led by the Holy Spirit. And then teach others to do the same thing. Don't get glory out of your fasting and try to, you know, Jesus said, when you fast, don't, don't mourn and cry and put ashes on your head. Woe is me, I didn't have a quarter pounder today. No, don't do that. Look normal. Somebody invites you out to lunch, say, well, I'm not eating today, but thank you.
I'm, I'm skipping lunch today. I mean, just, just be cordial about it. Don't make a big thing out of it. You don't need to teach them for 40 minutes on how you're fasting. Just be cordial about it. Then when they begin to see the difference in your walk with God, then you can share with them about fasting and praying for others. If we don't do this, the rest of the body is not going to get free. We can complain about it all day long. That isn't going to do a thing. We got to fast and pray until we see those bands of wickedness broken off the rest of the body. And then we can separate the boys from the men who are really going to walk with God and who are not. You can't tell when they're all bound up. But when they're free, let them make the decision, hot or cold, your choice. But I freed you out of lukewarmness. Father, we thank you tonight, Father, that you have given us a clarion call to move out of lukewarmness. Not only for us to move out of lukewarmness, but Father, for us to begin fasting and praying for your bride, for your body, for it to be taken out of the trap, the snare that the enemy has set for them. Father, give us your grace to be led by your spirit on when to fast and how to pray and the direction that each fast must target in on. Is it bonds of wickedness? Is it oppression? Is it confusion? Father, each time that we fast, we'll have a specific thing to target in on. Father, give us the grace to hear. And Father, give us the grace to have consistency, not to get excited about it today and then forget about it tomorrow. But Father, add it to our walk and our lifestyle that will remain with us the rest of our lives, we ask. In Jesus' name.